All right, so let's go ahead and start our first exercise. And um, in this exercise, which we've labeled particles, um, we're going to create particles from simple points. Now, when we're talking about physical geometry, um, when we're talking about simulation, we mentioned this term earlier, and we're going to get into that here in a second. This is what we're going to produce, a series of particles that will fall under what we'll think of as gravity. All right? So um, in turning our points into particles, we need to first kind of take a step back and uh, think about our physics class that we had probably a while back and um, revisit Newton's laws of motion. And there's three, but specifically we're going to look at the second law of motion by Newton, which states that an, the acceleration of a body is parallel and directly proportional to the net force acting on the body. It's in the same direction of the net force and is inversely proportional to the mass of the body. So we need to have three things in order for our objects to move as if they exist in the world that, as we know it. So we need a body, we need force, and we need mass. All right? So the body, we're first going to start with points because they're just super simple and that's an easy way to create a body. Um, we're going to have to uh, revisit the topic of force and mass here in a second. Um, but um, if we distill Newton's law down into an equation, it's that force equals mass times acceleration. F equals ma. All right, so um, we have to have bodies, right? So we're going to start with points. We need to have uh, an additional property beyond its coordinate in the world. Uh, we'll call that mass. And that's going to determine the relationship that it has between other objects that have mass and forces that are applied to that object. All right, so um, points, again, as a recap or a refresher, they are represented by an ordered set of numbers called coordinates. And typically, we uh, represent those numbers within the Cartesian space, right? So our point in world space is x, y, z, has those three values. Um, but if we want to start working with particles, right, um, to define them, they are, particles are localized objects with physical properties that have been assigned to them. So this means that in addition to x, y, and z, for our point to be understood as particle, we have to give it at least one more property. And um, for starters, the simplest one is to work with mass, right? So we now have a body, which is going to be represented by our point. We're assigning it mass, which is its physical property, and in that way, we can understand it as a particle. And one, one last note, our particles will be independent of size, shape, and structure, right? So localized object, that just means a point with physical properties. We do not have size, shape, or structure at this point. All right, so relative to kangaroo, a couple of notes about particles. If two or more points uh, in the initial input to the kangaroo physics engine object are in the same position, they will get joined together and treated as a single particle by kangaroo. So kangaroo will automatically merge objects to, that it thinks are um, the same together. So we don't need to specifically weld or remove duplicates uh, necessarily uh, when we're working with uh, particles. Okay, so um, we've, we have a body, we have mass, uh, but we now need to work with forces, right? And in the simplest sense, the kind of correspondent, corresponding um, mathematical or geometrical description is going to be through vectors. And vectors are abstract data types describing direction and magnitude, right? So here's a diagram of a vector, right? It is um, uh, anchored at a base and is moving in this diagonal direction. It has va numerical values assigned to it that describe the difference between the end point and the start point of our vector. And if we had this vector pointing down, right, we can think of this as gravity. Or if this is home plate in a baseball game, and this is the trajectory that we hit the ball, right, this is the force uh, by which we are going to manipulate our particles. 
All right, so a force is just any influence causing change in speed, change in direction, or change in, in shape. All right, so um, Newton's law of motion was F equals MA. If we break that down just a little bit further, um, if we, rem we remember what acceleration means, that is the change in velocity over the change in time. So we have all of the elements that we need here, right? Um, velocity, that can be described by, by um, a vector. Mass, that's going to be related to our particle. And force, it's going to be the um, value applied to that velocity. Now, the last element that we haven't gotten to yet is the change in time. Right? So if we want to see something accelerate, we have to put it in time. Right? So whenever we're working with a grasshopper definition, it is solving instantaneously, or trying to at least. Right? There's only now. There's not yesterday or tomorrow. There's only now. So in order to place our simulation within time, we have to use a special object in grasshopper called the timer. And the timer is, is the object which fires update events at, spe at specified intervals to specific objects, right? A uh, quick note, the process is somewhat dangerous because updates might occur when we're not expecting them. And um, lastly, that whenever a timer is enabled for the first time, there will be a global abort appearing in the Windows notification bar. And we'll go over that in a second. Um, coming back to the physics engine object, we're going to be connecting our timer to the physics engine object so that it can store the current, calculate the next, and refresh all of the values and um, geometrical elements that are corresponding to the uh, simulation in time. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, execute our first exercise here. So I'm going to bounce back to Rhino, and um, I can go ahead and launch Grasshopper now by typing that into the command line. Again, you should be using version 914, which can be um, the number can be found here at the bottom right in case you uh, want to double check. All right, and if we um, successfully installed Kangaroo, we're going to see here a new tab called Kangaroo on the far right. All right, so if you've been using Kangaroo recently, you'll see that most of the same objects still exist uh, before this release, um, I mean. Uh, the objects here um, are mostly the same. Again, on the Kangaroo tab, uh, mostly the same. But under the Utility tab, this is where all of those user objects come into play. And these are the uh, newest additions that actually make our life a lot easier and is going to um, allow us the ability to go quite a bit further than we uh, we're going to uh, before this release was um, was uh, uploaded last night. So we're going to be able to do some more fun stuff than uh, we were even expecting to be able to. All right, so um, to take a look at the first file that we're going to produce together, just to give you a, a quick hint, uh, this is how all the files are created and um, saved incrementally, uh, and we label them and um, give you these as a reference, and then we'll build this back up from scratch together. All right, so this is all we're going to try and achieve in our first exercise. And the objective here is that we're going to start to work with particles. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to um, take this file, so this is our first one, and I'm going to do save as, I'm going to do underscore w. That's my working file. Uh, that's the format we've been using for all the webinars. Uh, so the files that we produce together will also distribute after the um, conclusion of the webinar in case we do anything slightly differently when we build them together. All right, so d underscore W, and then I'm going to delete everything but my little notes here. And again, these are uh, the same notes that we went over in the presentation. I'm just in here for your reference um, once again. All right, so the idea here is that we want to use a line or a curve as a way to um, determine where uh, our particles are going to start from. Right? So uh, go ahead and draw a curve in front view. I'm just going to draw a simple curve, something like that, in front view, 
I'll turn off my grid um, to make this a little bit easier to see. All right, and there's my simple curve. All right, so let's go ahead and use this as a way to generate some points. All right, so in Grasshopper, we're going to go to the params tab and grab the under the geometry sub tab the curve object. And this is my curve container. So I'm going to store this curve in there by right-clicking and saying set one curve. All right, it's turned green when I select it. It's red when I don't. So that means that that curve that I had in Rhino is now stored inside of this object. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a, a label so we can keep track of all of our objects as we go. Um, I'm going to group it by doing Control G or Edit Group uh, with it selected. And then I'm going to right click and give myself a little note here that this is my, car, my curve, input curve. That's where I start. Okay. And um, we could have just created some points and brought them into Grasshopper also, but um, uh, we're going to use this curve as a way to create a variable number of points as we go, something we can have a little bit more control over. All right, so in order to get points from my curve, I want to divide this curve into equally spaced points. So that's going to be under the Curve tab. Under Division, I'm just going to do a simple divide curve. So we'll drop that down into the canvas, and this asks for the curve to divide, the number of segments that I want, and an option here if I want to split segments at cakes, which we can ignore. All right, so let's go ahead and drop our curve into C. There's already a locally defined value here in N. And let's get more specific. We want to specify how many divisions we want uh, as opposed to using the default value. So let's use a slider. And I'm going to go ahead and use my uh, shortcut uh, that we've been using in the webinars by double-clicking on the canvas. And instead of typing in a search keyword, I'm going to type in uh, a string of characters that's going to allow me to automatically create a slider with the domain that I want. So I'm going to say that I have to have at least one uh, division less than how many divisions I want now, which I'll say 20, less than um, 20 less than uh, 50. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and um, connect this to N. And um, this will allow us to control how many divisions of the curve that we had. All right, and this is, um, we're going to call this slider num divisions or num div, something like that. Um, all right, so we got a couple of uh, notes in the question window about the, um, the additional utilities that came in with the user objects. So we'll keep going with this file. We don't need these yet. Um, but before the next file, we will go back over getting those installed in Grasshopper. All right, so um, we now have our points, and we're going to turn these points into our uh, particles, right? So um, before, we, um, before we actually assign them mass, let's look at the other half of the uh, equation that we need, which is the force, right? So all of the forces that um, Kangaroo is able to work with, uh, which by now there's quite a few that we can uh, use, um, we're going to start with uh, the most basic, which is the unary force. And this is a, a force that's acting along a vector based on a particular point. Um, so we can think of this as gravity, as the icon suggests. We'll take that unary force, drop it onto the canvas, and all this asks for is the point that we want to apply our force to and the force itself. And this is going to be a vector right, that describes that force. Right? So if I'm in front view and I want my, my points to fall down, right, um, I'm going to use a negative z vector in order to apply that force to these points. Okay, so um, these points here, that's what we want to use for our unary force. So we'll go ahead and drop p into point. All right, and then uh, for our force, we need to create a vector. So let's go to the Vector tab, and uh, under the Vector sub-tab, 
Let's use one of our pre-built vectors, such as unit Z. Drop that into the canvas. Right? And this already has a vector um, built in it by default that's of length 1 moving in the positive Z direction. Um, so that's great. We can connect this and it will work. Um, but let's go ahead and be a little bit more specific. Let's grab a panel from our uh, params input tab and drop it into the canvas. And this is going to be our gravity factor, right? And let's say something like negative 9, all right? So negative 9 is going to be the value that we use to define the direction and magnitude of our unary force, right? by way of the z vector. All right, great. So let's, now that we have that set up, everything looks happy. Uh, all the objects are gray, not orange or red. So um, we've successfully used this object, and let's see what it gives us. So I'm going to drop another panel into the canvas and put the result of my, um, my unary force object into it. And we can see here that it's not a point any longer, it's not a vector, it's a special type of object uh, or type of data called a kangaroo KU force. All right? So whenever we're using the force objects in kangaroo, we're actually creating a special type of data that can be used with the grasshopper, uh, sorry, the kangaroo uh, physics engine. All right? So, um, once we've done this, we've now created uh, some physical relationships by assigning physical properties to our points.